Welcome, everybody. It is time for the No Name Cinema Society. It is Monday, January 8th, 2018. I'm still not getting used to saying that. And this is our Indie Spotlight, a part of our 46th series of episodes, our final series of episodes for our third season, and hence our final Indie from 2012. And it is The Deep Blue Sea is our Indie Spotlight. Hello, everybody. My name is Jonathan Betzler. Uh, excuse me, I, I, I just... Uh, I've gotten back from New York, as you know, and I, I, I've got a little, I gave me a little cold in New York, so I'm going to be a little sniffly over the course of the episode. I apologize in advance uh, for that. And as you can see, I am back in Los Angeles. Strangely enough, I've got to go back to New York tomorrow. So for the classic on Thursday, you'll see me in New York, and I'll be back here for next week's uh, sound off. So it's uh, back and forth, but then it'll settle down uh, once, uh, once we get closer to the Oscars. So, uh, with that said, let me uh, introduce my uh, co-hosts for this evening. Um, and so let's start with our, our old standard, our own cuckolded husband, assuming he had a wife. Ladies and gentlemen, Drunk Davey is back with us for the Indie Spotlight. I'm not the one watching my exes. I think it was September, October, we started expanding the society. It used to be just me, Jay Money, and Davey. But Jay Money moved on, thankfully, and now we have all sorts of people that are that are with us. And we, are, I'm happy to introduce to you right now our newest member, ladies and gentlemen, actor, writer, musician, and neighbor, <laughs> Nate Schelke is with us tonight. Hello, hello. Thank you for joining the society. You're also a frequent guest at my classic movie screenings. That's so true. That's that's kind of exciting. So I know what you bring to the table. And also, the audience should know that I sometimes refer to Nate as AFNS, um, the always funny Nate Schelke. So he's going to bring it. He's going to bring the comedy to the, to our show. It's true. I will be funny. Yeah. <laughs> Already. Already he's got me laughing. <laughs> Not Davey, though. He gets to work a little harder on Davey. Here's our schedule for this current uh, series of episodes, our 46th and final of our third season. This past Friday, January the 5th, we discussed Steven Spielberg's new film, The Post. Of course, now is our indie spotlight, the 2012 film, The Deep Blue Sea. In just a few days, this Thursday, January 11th, we do our final classic of the year, celebrating its 50th anniversary. Bonnie and Clyde will be our film for discussion on Thursday. And Nate will be back with us on January 15th, a week from tonight, to do our 30th sound off. We have a special announcement. Davey's got one of his diatribes, and Davey has assigned me to count down the top five films from 1967, the top five films from 50 years ago, based on our discussion of Binding Clyde. That's all happening in the sound off, which brings us to, ladies and gentlemen, the trivia that we gave you in the last episode was that the, the, it was about a successful but almost forgotten British playwright of the 40s and 50s gets readapted in 2012. And that playwright, of course, now, maybe not, of course, because he's somewhat forgotten, is a gentleman by the name of Terrence Radigan. Now, you have a background in theater, Nate. Had you heard of Terrence Radigan before yesterday? There's a line in the movie, which I assume is from the play, that that was familiar to me. That jarred something in me. And I study theater quite a bit. I was unfamiliar with them. Other plays by Terrence Radigan might sound somewhat familiar, but you maybe didn't know the playwright. The Browning version, The Winslow Boy, and potentially his most famous one is called Separate Tables. And Simple Tables might be most famous because there was a 1958 film made about it that would win an Oscar for David Niven as Best Actor. And there's another film version of this movie as well, made from 1955, starring the one and only Vivian Lee. So uh, this play has quite a history, but at the same time, it's something that was far into a lot of us. Summary time. In London, in and around 1950, Hester Collier is married to a prominent high court judge, but is having an affair with a younger war hero. On the day of the story, she struggles with the deep, helpless, passionate love she feels for this former fighter pilot in spite of the fact that he doesn't return her love as completely. As gentle and forgiving as her husband wants to be, she can't bring herself to going back to that life in spite of all the comforts it offers. And so her thoughts turn to ending it all. She is, as she says, caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. So how is that summary? Honestly, great. Oh, I love you, Nate. Davey? I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> oh. <laughs> anyway, never mind. <laughs> anyway, um, if he's not careful, I'm going to make him do the summaries from now on. Um, anyway. Okay. Great, great. <laughs> so, um, all right. So, normally I'm the last to do opening thoughts, except for indie spotlights when whoever's re recommending the film 
gives their reasons for recommendation. So, uh, so I'm going to start talking about the Deep Blue Sea. Um, and I think it's fitting that it's the final indie of the third season, as I think it's directly connected spiritually, visually, musically, and thematically with the first classic film that we talked about this season, David Lean's Brief Encounter. Over the course of the show, there have been a handful of films, mainly indies, that we've talked about having one particular thing that has raised the level of the film. And this subject came up on Dom Hemingway, our discussion of Comet, My Week with Marilyn, Tyrannosaur, and Young Adult. All those films had at its center a performance that elevated its material. And I think this film is another example of that. Rachel Weisz's performance as Hester is, I think, perhaps one of the best of the last decade in close competition with their countrywoman, Rebecca Hall, who I talked about last year in her work in the film, Christine. I have my own awards thing that I do every year called the Myriad Arts Awards, as some of you may know, and both Rachel Weisz and Simon Russell Beale were nominated uh, for that in 2012. Neither of them got an Oscar nomination, although Rachel Weisz did get a Golden Globe nomination and she was named Best Actress by the New York Film Critics of that year, so I wasn't alone in admiring this performance. Um, though it was the performance that stuck with me over the years, I was reminded last night, watching it with Nate, how beautiful the direction was. And I'll talk more about that a little later. Now, I watched it with Nate, so I already know the answer to this question, so I'll let him go first. Nate, you hadn't, uh, you hadn't seen this before, but you think you may have heard of it. Yes, that's right. Uh, when I had um, sort of seen a trailer of it, it seemed familiar to me. Davey, had you even heard of it before watching it for this? I uh, know. Okay, now it's time for uh, opening thoughts. And, uh, you know, to, again, because everybody gets an opening thoughts wrong, I'm going to let Davey go first and show Nate how it's done since it's Nate's first show. Opening thoughts, Davey. Yeah, I, you know, I liked it, but if you have to choose one, uh, go, go with the shark movie. Oh, wow. Nate, opening thoughts. At the end of the day, I think I prefer other movies about... Um, you know, like a period uh, subdued, passionate love encounter between two English people. <laughs> well, I, I almost don't disagree with that. Um, however, uh, on its own, I mean, like, would you call it a bad movie, a good movie? It's not a bad movie, but it feels a bit like homework sometimes. It feels a bit like homework sometimes would have been a perfect opening statement all on, all on its own. It says a lot without saying too much. I like it. Um, anyway. So let's start with, I think, the thing that, uh, uh, that is the most remarkable about it, uh, which is uh, performances led, of course, by Rachel Weisz. There's so much to say about Rachel Weisz, I hardly know where to begin. The inconsistencies of Hester's depression ring true in her portrayal. So when she vacillates between a reasonable calm and hysteria, it's wholly believable to me. And I think that's an intense challenge for, for any actor, which she rises to. You guys have anything on Rachel Weisz? I mean, I think it's an incredible performance. I I'm not overselling it. No, you're not. I didn't know she had it in her. I never thought she was a bad actress or anything, but this is just another level. I, it was really impressive. Nate, you're a trained actor. What do you think? Yeah, I've always loved her. She's great in this, especially since there's vast stretches, including the the opening, which I have thoughts about uh, whether it's, I mean, quite uh, many minutes before she even says something, uh, you know, there's a voiceover piece and then, but then nothing, you know, and, uh, and I think uh, she's great. And I want to get to that opening thing when we talk about direction and maybe story structure. But I do want to, uh, I do think, as far as she's concerned, the devil is in the details of performance. And I just have a, a, a couple examples um, to, to discuss. One, the moment when her husband first catches her, she's first discovered by her husband, her back is to camera. And the arch of her back when she's first discovered, it's like a subtle thing, but it's a thing of beauty. You don't need to see her close up. You don't need to see her turn around. You know exactly what's going on just by her back. It sounds weird to say out loud, back acting, but it, it's you have to see it, like the physicality that she embodies. Also, I don't want to give away the ending. She has to say goodbye to someone towards the end. She looks down for a long period of time before she like musters up the courage in a very subtle way. It's like a great choice, I think. Final example, and there's tons of them in the film, but I've actually got a visual example here for you. I've got a clip. Apparently in bars in the 50s, groups have sing-alongs. Everybody sort of was singing along to the, the music, and which I think is a great detail because that seems to ring true as a part of post-war uh, England. Um, Hester, however, was in a different class, social class during the war, so she doesn't know the words to these pop songs. So she's the only one, and I think that's another great detail that you'll see in the scene. 
but as, as relates to her performance, note her lustful look as Tom Hiddleston is singing to her. She has a lustful look and then the slightest quiver. And it's subtle, but it's beautiful. I think it's amazing. Take a look at this clip. this clip does is highlights the role of music in the movie which we'll maybe talk about shortly a little later so guys do you see my meaning about uh, these details in a performance yeah i totally do uh, i that in particular is a great sequence like uh because i i think like there's so much going on with her in that scene because i think it's it's the um you know, there, there's part of that is that like, oh, she doesn't know the words. But I also feel like there's an aspect of that she can never be comfortable in this relationship. You know, she, or, in, or in this class system, or in this class like, system. Yes, of course. But but even just like it reminds me of like if someone's dating someone and like it's that type of thing, like they're just volatile and you just never know when something's gonna change. And so even though it's going great, she can't even relax in that moment. That's very astute. I, I really like that. Davey? No, I agree. And I, I think that there's times in this movie where she just kinda, she'll start looking away from the person that she's talking to and you can tell that it's too painful to make eye contact at, at that particular time. And the, the details of her uh, mannerisms, they all are thoughtful and they all come across. Yeah, I mean, she has fully inhabited this character, and, and that's where the details come from. I mean, she might say that some of these things she didn't realize she was doing it because she was so far into into Hester. You know, we could do a whole show on uh, Rachel Weisz here, but let's talk about real quickly some of the other uh, performances. There's only two other major actors in the film. Simon Russell Beale, which is an actor I've admired for a while now, although he doesn't have as much of a film career. He's a stage actor primarily, and I've seen him a couple times in New York. He's a phenomenal underused actor. I really enjoy his unique line readings from time to time, his detailed physicality, his gait. He was doing some fascinating things with, with his eyebrows. I almost felt like he was playing William like a child, like innocent and oblivious, just these complex matters of the heart. And I think that in and of itself was a unique and interesting choice and interpretation. Davey, I'll let you go first on Simon Russell Beale. You know, I'm willing to admit that I may be reading into it a bit. He's supposed to be a judge and he, he seems like he's taking a more analytical view of of emotional uh situations than than the normal person would and it, just 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 the way he's processing and i i i think he was doing that as a judge like he was carrying that that job with him throughout the film and i think it worked really well yeah i mean it's a part of his personality and he certainly embodied that i, I agree with that nate i mean one of my favorite scenes in the movie is t with his mother and rachel vice it's great watching him because it's like his yeah. face is amazing. One of the like, meanest mothers thinks, you'll ever meet. Yeah, yeah. But he thinks this is great. You know, like having well, he, he, mother. He's getting his girls together. His wife and his mummy, he calls her mummy, grown man. Going back to my childlike nature of him. That's a really interesting scene and so much subtext going on in that scene. So that's, yeah, that, that's terrific. And the, and the mom is, is great too. Real quickly, Tom Hiddleston. I think Tom Hiddleston showed a great understanding of this character his feelings and his motivations. And as an actor, he definitely made that clear to us. However, I feel like he lacked that upper echelon of detail that the other two performances have. I'm not saying it's a bad performance, when it's very clear, it's a good performance, it's just what the movie needed. Compared to the other two, especially with what these other two actors are doing, the way that they're communicating so much so easily, we didn't get that from Tom Hiddleston as much, I think. Uh, Davey. 
I don't know, but I think maybe there's an element of when you're in the presence of somebody who's just killing it, maybe you, uh, maybe you, rather than try and hang or steal the scene, you, you kind of just get out of the way and, and let them go. Probably not, but I, I, he was fine. Nate, how do you feel about this getting out of the way theory? <laughs> I, well, sometimes, but if it's a two person scene, certainly not. Like, because there's, it's like, it was. you can always liken it to like, you know, playing tennis or something like that. Like you, you need to, someone to hit the ball back, you know? And if you don't, like you have nothing to push against. And I thought it was great though, because uh, just to see a young Tom Hiddleston before I didn't even, even when's the first Avengers like that's you know, or uh, Thor. The first yeah. Avengers was 2012, but I think Thor was 2010s, and you and I oh, saw really? Thor together. Okay, okay so this is Thor. right after it. Okay, perfect. Then. But it still was fun to like see him not be you know Loki, but he's playing a cad again, you know, and it's kind of like right in his wheelhouse. He had also done War Horse before this, a small role in War Horse. Oh, uh, okay. I think this role calls for like a raw performance, and, and I do feel like it doesn't match up to her. But I do want to talk about the thing that impressed me more the second time, and that is Terrence Davies' direction. And I don't know why it didn't stick with me the first time, but I, I, it really stuck with me on my home TV this time. Um, the I felt like the imagery was very evocative. The editing was very precise. The camera movements were very motivated and deliberate. I, I'm sure Davey will want to talk about the shot in the tube, the underground tube. Um, the overhead revolutions. Um, which I think reflected her downward spiral emotionally. Uh, the, those shots were just gorgeous. There's a, another one that's a very slow push into a phone booth that I think is just very evocative. The way that Davies uses the Mion Sen, there's so much detail in the design, which maybe we'll get to. Obviously, he provides a great environment for actors, so many great performances. I would argue that maybe there was times when he was possibly a little too much in love with his images, and maybe he lingered a little too long here and there. Overall, so many images I found it breathtaking. There are certain sequences that I really liked, like the bar scene. I love the ending, mirroring the beginning. But I will say, like, I felt that the opening took too long, and I found the music very jarring. I disagree with that. Let's table the music here. That's a paragraph on its own, quite frankly. But I would say that the one thing about those scenes that, that you listed, they're, they're all almost one shot. Like even without necessarily having lots of camera movement, without feeling overly theatrical either. It's just, but it's restraint. You know what I mean? Like it's letting the actors work within the space. I also think about the shot in the car. There's a low angle shot when Simon Russell Beale tells her that he's done with her uh, oh, yeah. and just holds in the car and they're just allowed to be. Somehow it feels much more present. It feels alive without needing to add cuts or, or any sort of additional stuff. Same thing with that bar shot that I just showed. Until it cuts to the dancing, it's all just one shot and you're just watching them. It's daring to some degree to be that confident in the, in the one shot. Davey. The one thing I have an issue with is the revolution, the viral shot. Really, I love that. Oh, totally. It doesn't work for me because, uh, you know, like you said, there's a lot of lingering shots and a lot of just letting the actors tell a story. And well, you see how it's sort of because it starts with their love affair, um, and, and then goes to him being a little distant, and then goes to her on the floor, you know, in the middle of a, a suicide attempt. And so yeah, no, but I, I just it's literally I think it's... a downward spiral. It literally is a good word. It's it's a little heavy handed for me. I, it just doesn't fit. I I generally I, I I'm I'm all for some stylization, but it just doesn't fit in this film. It's I would agree with you if it were any faster, but it's so slow and deliberate. That kind of movement is consistent throughout the film. The only thing that's unique about this is that it's an overhead. Um, but other than that, there's tons of camera movement, but it's all very slow and and very very slow, much slower than you're used to. Um, and I, so I think it's consistent in that regard. Um, and I, and it's certainly emotionally, I feel like it matched with the, the moment itself. Nate, you're going to tiebreaker for us. I am going to go with Davey here then that I, it took me out of it because like I said, like, I, I feel like stylistically it was different. It's like kind of a, the main piece of it is, is kind of a gritty realism type of thing. And, and that the opening I liked it, and then I was like, okay, let's start, and it didn't start, and, and I don't need that underscoring. It didn't add anything to me. It, it it only hindered it, as far as I was concerned. Okay, wow. That's a major disagreement. Um, so I don't have a lot of time left. I wanted to talk about design, but I think I'm going to skip ahead to score, because Nate already brought it up, and he just brought it up again, so he's aching. 
Aiken to talk about this score, which I'm going to disagree with him here because, and Davey will get the reference a little bit because this is very much akin to our first classic of this season, Brief Encounter. Samuel Barber's concerto here that he composed in 1947 is a direct correlation to the way that Brief Encounter uses the Rachmaninoff. This is a string-based piece versus the piano-based Rachmaninoff piece from Brief Encounter. It's dissonant at times, very powerful, but I also find it very emotional and heartbreaking to some degree. It really struck a chord with me. <laughs> and I think it sets the right tone because it disappears after that for a lot of the movie. It is just a first act thing. It makes the exposition a little easier to swallow instead of, because in the play, it's they just, they tell you all that information. And so by, they instead turn it into a montage with this beautiful, I, I find the music, I really like the Barbara music a lot. So maybe that's the, that's the disconnect is I, I like the, the music itself on its own. Um, and it did have an evocative impact on me. Like I, I felt something after seeing it. Dave, I'm going to start with you because I sort of know how Nate feels about it. And you saw a brief encounter. So no, I, I, I loved it as well. And I think it's, I think it's kind of a, a gutsy move by a director to, to, to play music that's that on the nose. I think it can. It's, it's, it's a real easy. I mean, it's, it's real easy to turn the thing into Suicide Squad. But it works because it's just so perfect um, in this in this film, and I like that it. That I like that you know pretty much after the first act is done, like it's it. That's that's the mood for that act, and it's it's pretty perfect. Yeah, no, I, I liked it a lot. I want to have a have a brother in a second, but before we do, I just want to see. Did you while watching the movie get the connection to Brief Encounter? Oh, absolutely. Yes, yes. The uh, Rock Monarch, the Piano Concerto, it, it's used the same way. And in fact, I wonder, was this an influence? Did, did he say it was an influence? Is anybody oh, yeah. Asked? There's shots that he says, I rip off Brief Encounter throughout this whole movie. There's a shot in the library that is a direct correlation to when C.D. Johnson sitting across from her husband, like during the, all that flashback stuff. There's a scene on the train with the lights when she's considering ending it all again on, you know, on the platform. All that is directly from Brief Encounter. And I had made a note about it before watching the commentary, and then the commentary confirmed it. Nate. I don't want to get too off topic. Your rebuttal, if you will. Yeah. Like, I think that, I thought the, the music was beautiful, but, and maybe it was, you know, at the volume we're watching it, but I felt it was a little too intense, a little too screechy, and it set a tone of melodrama, which it ends. And I was like, are we still going to start watching Camille? Like, what is this? You know, like, <laughs> and, um, but then it changes, totally, it totally changes. And so... I thought it was effective. I just wanted it to be a little bit more minimized. I understand it. We're underscoring this suicide in her head. You know, it just went on for a bit too long for this man's taste. That's when you know he's done a point when he makes funny voices. I, you could ask me to turn it down if there was a volume issue. Like, I would have happily <laughs> done that. I do want to say the one thing that I don't, that's an issue about the movie, because this leads directly into themes, is um, the one drawback, I think, is the plot itself is sort of flimsy and tired. The film's made to be special by the other filmic elements. So that's why it's a little lower on the list for me is, granted, affairs were more scandalous back then and hence potentially more intriguing. It doesn't cover new ground. That doesn't necessarily mean you don't feel anything, but I do think there was nothing new or fresh about this story. Uh, yeah, and that's why I said in the opening that there were other stories that we've watched that I felt like covered yeah. this ground better. And I said I agreed with you about that. Yeah, yeah. It totally reminds me of Atonement. And what's that Graham Greene? End of the Affair? End of the affair, yeah. Yeah. Brief encounter, Dr. Zhivago. Plot wise, and, and also like dialogue wise, so it didn't necessarily um, live up to some of those stories. Well, I, I did like the dialogue, and Brief Encounter is a better film, but I, I was thinking, I did think the dialogue was a little more nuanced than it was in Brief Encounter. Davey, do you have thoughts on that? I agree that the, the dialogue carries the film in a lot of ways, but I, I also think that the stories not particularly interesting. I mean, we're agreed on that point, I think. Yeah, it, it, it's, it suffers for that. But, you know, it's funny because I'm, I'm thinking about how much I liked Brief Encounter, and I'm wondering why I almost need to watch Brief Encounter again because I, I can't place why I like it so much. Two words, David Lean. David Lean takes this basic story, and Terrence Davies does too, but David Lean even more. You think about the train sequence that we showed as a clip on the show where she sort of imagines their life together. That's just amazing stuff. The high contrast lighting, all that stuff is just terrific. Celia Johnson's performance is very good too. Brief Encounter is a bit of a masterpiece. It's really about film direction there, because also David Lean way ahead of his time in Brief Encounter. Theme-wise, things that, that I was thinking about, it made me think of the cycle of need, this idea and this love triangle, and it's how it's sort of, you know, one person needs the other who needs the other, and it's just sort of nobody's happy in the end. 
Um, it also makes you wonder, I think, about monogamy in general. <laughs> and, and maybe that's a, you know, a selfish thing that I'm trying to bring out here, but it makes it, because it just sort of, you get the feeling that uh, as much as Hester thinks she needs Freddie, you know, he's right for her right now, but if she eventually can get over it, like William was right for her for a certain point of time, Freddie was right for a certain point of time, and she's still young-ish, like early 40s. There's other people that are, will be right for her, even in the 1950s. So guys, cycle of need, monogamy, anything? All right, now that we talk about it, passion versus settling versus convenience. That, that's sort of what I mean about mon monogamy. I actually had another theme. Maybe it's not its own theme, just an idea that the film is putting forward that's related to that. And I was going to save it for last because it's one of the more out-of-the-box ideas that I had about the film. Um, and that is, I felt like there was a compare and contrast between what was going on in the story and in the mise-en-scene how the old London was destroyed from the war and it was being rebuilt around them. You know, in the last shot sort of hammers this home and it sort of, sort of made me think that London is more than just rebuilding their infrastructure. This film sort of says that maybe it's rethinking its social mores and these ideas of what's appropriate, what's right. I think that the mise-en-scene suggests that in the 1950s, things were not just changing to the city physically, but socially as well. I don't know if she's pushed to this marriage, but she married the first guy who was asked. They probably didn't court much beforehand. He was a well-off dude, you know, from a well-off family. Her vicar dad was like, yeah, I'd marry this guy. And she's like, doesn't know any better. And she's like, okay. So, I mean, I feel like Freddie is the first time that she ever felt anything, that she ever felt lust. The first time that she ever had an orgasm. Powerful ideas to someone that hadn't experienced that, especially by late 30s, early 40s. Her passion for Freddie comes from the fact that it's so new. She's inexperienced, even at her age. And it's almost sad at that age, which is why from this historical prism looking at it, we can say that was a problem, the way that they did relationships back then and sort of pushing these women into these relationships in this very you know patriarchal society. You know That is, I think, part of that rebuilding social mores kind of theme. The film takes great pains to remind you that suicide attempts were illegal at the time. And I think that's another sort of gesture to how people are starting to rethink that and how London is rebuilding itself post-war. It's also reassessing some of these values that they, that they had um, and some of these ideas. Because the thought of a suicide being illegal is, seems insane to us. Right, Davey? Wow, I didn't even realize that that had been the case. That's. I don't think it, you would know better, you're the lawyer, but I don't think that's true in America. I think that was just a British thing. But I do think that there is something in this movie about mental illness and the lack of understanding of mental illness at the time. And not that she needs to be put away. The way that her suicide attempt and overall depression is treated is not with kid gloves and not how we would do it today. There is sort of a suggestion there too that that was very much of the time and contributing to the making the problems worse. Throughout the movie, I was thinking about the concept of mental illness and how treatment and dealing thereof has changed over the years. Davey, anything on that? Maybe people's lack of understanding of it manifested in, in a, just a callousness and a, you know, the reprimanding a person for attempting suicide, it seems at this point just so absurd, but. Uncouth. I, I, yeah, it's just cruel, just cruel. <laughs> and I, 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 I was using a word from the movie. They, 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 there's a scene where yeah. he yells the word uncouth a couple times. And... It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's jarring to see, it really is. There's an aspect that goes to that, uh, you know, sexuality in this time period, you know, a repression, too much passion, if that's like clamped down, like I feel like that's part of it, that's sort of censored towards this. They even talk about this, the 1800s is calling women hysterical, you know, but it's really like they're sexually repressed. It drives them a bit crazy, you know? Yeah, and they have no control like, over their sexuality. Yeah, yeah. All right, guys, that just about wraps it up for this Indie Spotlight, our discussion of the Deep Blue Sea. Thanks, Nate. And welcome to the No Name Cinema Society, Nate. Uh, you were amazing as expected. Yeah, all right. Um, all right, so uh, trivia tidbit. Um, you know, obviously, this is our last indie from 2012. Throughout 2018, per tradition, we'll be going back five years and looking at indies from 2013. And so I got a trivia tidbit for you, although this won't be until the end of March or early April because we've got our finale episodes coming up at the end of February. And then we're going to take some time off and start our fourth season beginning of March, early April. Stay tuned on Facebook and Twitter for that information. But our first Indie Spotlight from 2013 will feature an actor that was recently replaced as the actor we've discussed the most on this show. He will get a chance to reclaim that title in our next Indie Spotlight. And you really got to watch the show to understand that reference. So fans, you know, I'm relying on you to know the answer to this. And it's a 23rd entry starring an actor that we've discussed quite a bit about that in a previous sound off. However, you will see us again before that, just three days, Thursday, 
we are going to talk about Bonnie and Clyde, celebrating the 50th anniversary of Bonnie and Clyde. It's our classic movie discussion, and that'll be the next time you see us. It'll be our final classic movie discussion of our third season. So until then, this meeting of the No Name Cinema Society is adjourned. <laughs>